mind. And that's free. And it's only at this point a little teeny tiny bit uh, more complicated and unfamiliar than a typical banking experience. That's so getting very, very close to uh, being usable without any expertise or any, any knowledge needed about all the technology underneath it. Does that begin to make sense a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I guess just the fact that these technologies remove the need for third parties, right? Like that's like the, yes. like m most of the time at least. Um, and that's super useful uh, because it's more yeah. efficient. Um, you know, in it, I think because these uh, technologies are underpinned by, you know, maths, crypto, um, cryptography, uh, computation, all this sort of stuff, we can kind of, rather than having to trust people, we can say in maths we trust or, you know, in, <laughs> uh, I'll just say in maths we trust. Um, yeah. One thing that, um, this, this idea of banking, um, is it DeFi or DeFi? I, I don't know how, to, how it's pronounced. De DeFi. Yeah, DeFi. It's, uh, it's, it's a shortening of decentralized finance and it has the added benefit of sounding like DeFi, Defi Defiance, <laughs> DeFi. It's very, I love it. It's a great term, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this um, notion of banking fits right into that. And yeah. that seems to, I, I'm not too familiar with it, but I know that it's getting, it's spoken about a lot on, at least on Twitter. Like it's, it's one of the hot topics um, yes. or hot developments. Um, so do you know much about it and what's actually going on in that space? I know a fair amount, yeah. Um, there are a couple things that are very exciting about DeFi. So the, the banking platform that I just described is an example. It's one of the more basic examples of DeFi. Uh, decentralized, meaning it's not all uh, under the control of a single company or government. It's spread out over the world in all these horcruxes. Finance you, actually deals with instruments of value. So uh, these sort of software-based uh, banks are an example of DeFi, a very simple example. And once you have this, you can uh, do things that are more complicated than banking. You can redirect the interest to other places. You can create uh, prediction markets that automatically settle when uh, certain data is, is, is reported. You can uh, create automated trading strategies that work uh, on software that nobody can interrupt you can um, create new lending and credit type mechanisms and swaps and all kinds of fancy derivatives that are really beyond my expertise. But there's a lot of excitement in the DeFi space in particular around uh, exotic financial instruments being kind of replicated on DeFi to extract all these new kinds of, of profits uh, from from this new ecosystem. So that's where a lot of the excitement is coming from. And honestly, my background is not in high tech finance and it doesn't excite me as much as the people for whom uh, that's been their life's work. But there's definitely a lot of experimentation and interest and and tinkering and uh, and and money making happening about it. So there's there's a big there's a big um, frenzy right now yeah yeah i feel like it's it could i'm getting at the idea of it's like the ico phase but that you can trust more because it does seem like there's less downside than the ico craze which mm. was so brand new and ultimately you when when you bought an ico which was uh, an initial coin offering when people were all selling their own token to uh, fund their network. You had to trust the team you were buying the token from to deliver on their promises. And that's not really an innovation in trustlessness, whereas DeFi is creating new ways to make money that are all based on this decentralized open source software. So you don't have to trust people in the same way that you did during the ICO craze. Um, I really the only thing they have in common is the craze. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people like to make money and this is, you know, an opportunity uh, to do so, but I'm, I'm more interested yeah. in the, um, the technology and just like the, the implications for how, how we live. Um, me, me too. 
and I should probably elaborate just for the for the sake of the listeners who might might not have as much of a background that uh, what this decentralized financial software allows us to do, why it's important is we can basically create companies that don't have CEOs, that don't have owners. We can create feedback mechanisms that say, if you do this, you'll get paid, and then you do it, and then you get paid. And there's nobody who can say, well, he did it, but we won't pay him. Uh, you can create an exact copy of uh, Facebook, basically, only when people buy ads to put on this network, the money goes to you, not to Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook shareholders. And there's no censorship. Like such things already exist. They're just not widely used for two reasons. One, people like Facebook too much. They don't feel like leaving. And two, the network fees on Ethereum are very high right now because it's kind of at its, at its capacity for all the transactions it can tolerate. But uh, this, that just begins to paint a picture of what kinds of uh, new incentives we can create in society. Uh, does that yeah. make it a little bit more clear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, we'll dive into you know, some of the work that you're doing in idea markets and all that soon, but I just want to talk I'm more sure about we'll get there. Yeah, crypto, yeah. crypto here. Um, I think that this decade could be the turning point for these technologies and will accelerate not only their adoption, but development because of just the instability, right? I mean, yeah. uh, I think as a, the time of the nation state is coming to an end for a variety of reasons, one being just like global challenges uh, that require global coordination and the fact that we're living in this interconnected world and uh, local, like the actions of one country sometimes might not be able to forestall um, economic collapse or, you know, a whole array of problems. Like one example that I thought of a few years ago, but now seems to be a lot more real is um, business process outsourcing and, techno and technology automating that. So the Philippines, I think more than 10% of the GDP comes from business process outsourcing. So call centers wow. and all that sort of stuff. And you've seen GPT-3, the, you know, the AI software that can just do incredible things. Um, like that sort of technology will automate call centers and, you know, among many, many other things. And it can do so yeah. in a very short period of time. So when a yeah. country, you know, derives so much of its um, GDP from these sorts of processes that can be automated overnight, it can bring about, you know, tremendous instability. Um, and that could lead to, you know, governments printing money to try to solve problems and yada, yada, yada. So as, as, as these things happen and uh, currencies potentially become to, they, as they perhaps destabilize, people are like, well, they may think, well, shit, I need to, um, I want my money to <laughs> retain its value somehow. How can I do it? Um, and how can I keep it safe as well? You know, they, they want to be able to, ensure that they'll be able to keep it, that no one will be able to take it from them. So I think that just this instability um, and the lack of trust people have in, in governments and the financial uh, instruments that you know, the government support, I think will really move us to adopt these technologies, mainly as a, as a out of uh, necessity rather yeah. than um, because we want to. Um, so it's a very important time for you know, the crypto space, but also just for, I guess, societies in, in general. And I just, I'm, I'm concerned that, I, I'm not really concerned, but as, as, people start, as people start to adopt these technologies, um, governments will try to crack down on them. And then more people will move to them because, you know, the government's cracking down on them and they're like, well, we know we can't trust the government, the government's trying to stop this. It cannot be stopped. And then we're in a, in a bit of a pickle. And one reason I think that, I, one thing that I'm concerned about is the state does a lot of good things. Yeah. Um, it provides, well, more so in Australia than or other countries, maybe the US, but like healthcare, you know, we have free education or something like that. Like the state, you know, public goods, infrastructure, like all states can provide this to varying levels. To, to varying levels. And I'm concerned that with the adoption of these technologies, um, particularly um, 
the ability to transfer wealth without it being tracked, you know, um, privacy coins like uh, Zcash or um, I've got the other one. Is it Monero? Yeah. Yeah. I'm concerned that high net worth individuals who contribute substantially to the tax to, to taxes, they'll just, you know, move it into crypto and it might not be able to be tracked. And then we'll, then the States will be suffering because they, they won't be able to, um, generate enough tax revenue and it could just not, it, it, it could be detrimental for all. And I, you know, I, I, I'm of the opinion that people are not entitled to keeping all of their wealth. Um, that they are not respond like, because they are not solely responsible for the wealth generation, they are not entitled yeah. to keeping all of it. Like yeah. if you generated wealth, thank you so much for contributing to society. You can keep a, a decent chunk of it, but we're going to take a lot of it to reinvest back into the world because it's the, it's the culture, it's the, our history that has enabled you to be where, to, uh, that has enabled you to get to where you are. So thank you. So like that, that's my perspective. And one that I don't think is very, is shared within the crypto community. Um, yeah. I, uh, we're, I, I feel you. Yeah. It's, it's kind of uncommon in the, in the crypto community. Yeah. So I've just, it, it's, it's a big cause of concern for me because I don't know how we stop that from happening and how we stop people from, adopting these techno I mean the, the adoption of these technologies is okay but I think people need to pay taxes or we need new ways in which to fund public goods and to fund um, the, yeah. the needs of the public um, anyway I'm just kind of rambled there but you know no I totally feel your thoughts? Um, are you familiar with uh, Bankatech Rao yeah VGR yeah, VGR. He said yeah. something recently uh, that I really agree with and love. It was just a few days ago. He said, uh, the problem that the libertarian left has to solve now uh, with blockchain, presumably, is uh, trustless compassion. And I, I've been thinking about this problem for some time. How can you trustlessly siphon money from uh, well-used crypto networks and ensure that it gets into the hands of people who will die without it? Mm. Uh, at, at, the very, at the very basic level, we have to make survival uh, a, a human right, basically. Yeah. Right now, if, 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 you're on, if you're on the street, if you're homeless, you're... Uh, you're, you're in a great deal of danger on every level, physical, psychological, emotional. If, uh, if trauma didn't make you homeless, homo homelessness will make you traumatized at the very, very least. So there's this sort of gun to the head of every single American uh, that, you know, we cannot become homeless because it's, 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 very close to death. It's a it's a real physical threat. It's a real just threat to to life completely. So uh, ensuring that people in this future uh, blockchain world can survive. There's a I have hope that this sort of trustless compassion is inevitable because enough people agree with this that. Uh, software will be built, decentralized applications will be built to fulfill this purpose. And with enough uh, use, with enough consensus, which I think exists, absolutely, um, they will find their way into uh, the infrastructure, into the well-used uh, network channels and everything like that. And I, 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 I do absolutely believe that there is the will and the desire and the ability to take care of people using this technology. Mm. Yeah, I hope that we, we see some, something like a, a universal basic income <laughs> paid through uh, crypto. When I say universal, I mean you know, truly global. Um, and I think just on, on this point of you know, those suffering, um, what I think people fail to realize is that 
well, no, I think a lot of people realize it, but it doesn't really enter our conversation as much, but um, empowering others benefits everyone. Yes. Like if, when you get someone off the street, when you give them education or access to the internet or access to healthcare, it benefits everyone. Like, yes. And, you know, right now, half the world doesn't have access to the internet, you know, over like nearly a billion people don't have access to energy, you know, or, you know, electricity. Yeah. Um, and that's just a, it's a waste in a way. Like we have all these incredible creative problem solvers scattered around the world that just don't have access to the same opportunities that we do. And if we were to empower them with something as simple as internet access, like if you give, if you give someone internet access, they can learn whatever they, whatever they want. So they can, you know, the, the, the landscape of opportunity extends more, an incredible amount. It's like the internet Absolutely. grants more opportunity than anything else. And what those people may do, even if it's just, you know, a fraction of a percent, um, you know, that it could result in developments that improve the world, improve the lives of literally everyone. Yeah, so absolutely. it's a, that's, I think that's a really strong um, argument for global wealth redistribution. And it's one that we're not really, this, this idea of global wealth redistribution and kind of empowering the, the, the poverty stricken in other countries isn't really the focus of, I'd say, left politics at the moment. It's kind of very, you know, identity politics focused, which is like, it's yeah. still important. I, the way I think about it is like, there's progress, there's like the tail end and there's like the vanguard. And we need people to push this way, but we also need to bring up the tail, right? But yeah. the tail yeah. is more important right now um, because we're talking about life and death rather than absolutely um, these more... I guess you could say privileged uh, discussions. Um, yeah. So I hope that, I hope that this, these technologies develop so that we can kind of move uh, in this direction.